Hello and welcome to a special Applied Radiology Expert Forum webinar on COVID-19, Radiology Response, A View from the Trenches. As we all know quite well by now, COVID-19 has and continues to affect every aspect of our personal and professional lives today. And particularly for those of you involved in any aspect of healthcare who must still see and treat patients, this can be even more challenging as you worry about your own safety and that of your families while caring for your patients. In this special webinar dedicated to the best practices in this era of COVID-19, I'm very pleased to introduce two respected physicians who chair their departments in busy hospital systems and who will share their insights and lessons learned over the last few weeks as they, with their colleagues, have prepared their departments to be in the best position possible to continue providing imaging services, as required in this ever-changing environment. So with that, let me introduce Dr. Edward Steiner, Chair of Imaging and Radiation Oncology at Wellspan York Hospital in York, Pennsylvania. Dr. Steiner's background includes fellowship training in interventional radiology, CT, ultrasound, and MRI. Dr. Steiner, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Do we have you on the line? Yes, Karen, thank you for the invite. Lovely. Joining Dr. Steiner today is Dr. Gopal Punjabi, who chairs the Department of Radiology at Hennepin Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Punjabi has broad experience in diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine and focuses primarily on thoracoabdominal and cardiac imaging. Dr. Punjabi, welcome, and thank you, too, for joining us. Do we have you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks again, gentlemen, for joining us. My name is Kieran Anderson, group publisher here at Applied Radiology, and I will be your host and moderator today for this special webinar. Today's program has been sponsored by Philips, and we would like to thank them for their continued support of events such as this. As a reminder, the information presented here today is that of the speakers, and any findings, data, or other things presented herein based on work and experience may not be reflective of installation vendor Philips policy or compliance. Following each presentation, we'll break for a Q&A, and we encourage you to submit any related questions that you may have for the, for the presenters through the Q&A area in the webcast portal. Please feel free to do this at any time during the event. So before we get started, let me just share a couple quick tips for you. You should be seeing a screen that looks like this. If you'd like to expand the slide area, please select from one of the options here. Over in the top right, we have a resource area with some links that may be of interest to you. To submit a question, please enter it in this box and click Submit. And finally, at the bottom is our control panel, which allows you to basically turn or turn off some of these windows for more enhanced viewing. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Steiner, who will begin his presentation now. Dr. Steiner, the floor is yours. Thank you. There we go. A little, a little lag on the computer. but uh, So my name is Ed Steiner, and I'm Chairman of Imaging and Radiation Oncology at Wilson Hospital. We are in South Central Pennsylvania. And I'll show you exactly where that is, since many of you may not know. Uh, York Hospital is a 580-bed academic community hospital. We have training programs in everything but imaging. We're a level one trauma center, a comprehensive stroke center, and we are the largest of a seven hospital system that spans everywhere from Ephrata, heading towards uh, Philadelphia, all the way through to the Summit Health System, uh, which is heading towards Pittsburgh. Uh, so we go from 75-bed hospitals to large 580-bed uh, 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 academic center. We perform 480,000 imaging studies at York and one of our private offices. Uh, and the system performs approximately 1.2 million exams. So how did this happen? How did this uh, pandemic arrive and when did we first hear about it? Well, personally, we heard about a virus, or I heard about a virus in Wuhan, China, and I had no idea where that was, and it was called coronavirus. And initially we were told that it is 
very similar to the common flu. Now, in, in that assessment, I just want to offer a little perspective. Um, I do some amateur uh, astronomy work. This is the Milky Way, and from my perspective, we were right where Earth is, where that little arrow is. And all the activity is happening in the center of the Milky Way, but we are away from it. And I don't think anybody paid that much uh, attention because flu in China is, is quite common. So let's look at the timeline. And this timeline is critical, especially for COVID-19. 12-21-2019, we hear about a cluster, an outbreak of a respiratory virus in Wuhan. Two months later, 224, northern Italy is, is shut down. And all of a sudden, this virus is coming closer to us, closer to the United States. Which would travel the way it is today. Uh, Europe is fairly close. As a matter of fact, I was going to give a, a, a talk in Austria right around that time. 311, the World Health Organization, declares COVID 19 a pandemic because of alarming spread. That is why this virus is special. So all of a sudden, we go from a, a remote arm uh, of the Milky Way to something that's coming into our solar system and is landing. So let's look uh, at the timeline a little closer. 121, we have the first confirmed U.S. death in Washington state. It kind of makes sense because of the travel, because of the origination of this virus. 224, one month later, the U.S. stock market plummets. Amazing. That, that's an amazing demographic right there, an amazing sequence of events. 3-8 we have 500 confirmed cases in the United States. 313, Trump declares a national emergency. 315, confirmed U.S. cases surpass 3,000. So we, we go from 500 to 3,000 in, in a number of days. New York, California, the state of Washington have the most confirmed cases. National death toll, 61. I mean, now that seems like an incredibly low number, but not, not to minimize, a, a death is a death and it's horrible. 320, five days later, Mayor de Blasio in New York is declaring New York the largest pandemic center, the epicenter of this crisis, with 5,151 cases, and again, 29 deaths. Um, every death is tragic. But 29 deaths is, is, is not what we thought we were going to see. It, that number is low. 323, the World Health Organization says more than 300,000 cases, 300, cases are reported throughout the world. 42, and again, this timeline is getting closer and closer and closer. The, the dates are getting closer to each other. 42, we have the first death in York, Pennsylvania, my neighborhood. So. So now it's coming home, and we are upticking our response significantly. By 412, Easter Sunday, New York City had 8,600 deaths, cumulative. So uh, an amazing timeline, and I think we need to be conscious of this. And, and the way we respond in imaging has to really, really reflect this timeline. This curve I'm sure we've seen time and time again. But, but it, it, it means two things. Number one, healthcare systems have capacity. And once you exceed the capacity, as we see in New York, we can no longer treat patients adequately. So the goal of flattening the curve is to basically prevent a tall spike. But when you look at the flattened curve, what you see is something else. What you see is that the number of cases are protracted, that all of a sudden you don't have a massive influx of cases, rapid death, and that's it. So the timeline is protracted, and that's where we are now. We're wondering how protracted will this timeline is, and for imaging, critical, because we need to respond. We need to start up the system 
we, we, we shut it down, and hopefully we shut it down rapidly, but when do we start up the system? So our perspective is now that we are home. We are here. We are responding to this crisis, and I think some of us are responding faster, some slower, some government agencies are responding faster and slower, and in many ways, victim uh, imaging is a victim of that response because we can't drive much of this governmental intervention. So here we are at York, Pennsylvania. This was a couple of days ago. Uh, we're screening at the doors. Nobody's going into the hospital other than physicians. Patients are not allowed to have their families in the hospital. We're testing temperatures on the way in. Uh, I'm an interventional radiologist. I did two biopsies uh, in the OR uh, on Monday. The patient's families were waiting in the garage. That's where we are uh, in imaging. Never thought we would get here, but we have to respond, and we have to respond rapidly, and we have to respond in a protracted manner because we don't know where we are. York, Pennsylvania is in the center. We are centrally positioned between Pittsburgh on the left, New York City and New Jersey on the right, Philadelphia, and these are major centers of COVID right now. New York, Trenton, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Baltimore, which is where I'm calling from right now, I live in Baltimore, uh, and Washington, D.C. So we are in the midst of this, but we have breathing room. We had the ability of responding rapidly because we weren't in the middle of a pandemic three weeks ago. We are in the middle of a pandemic now, and it's a big difference. So what, how do we prepare? Where are we now and where are we going? In many ways, I think we were fortunate. We had a measles outbreak at the end of last year, and it was significant. What that allowed us to do is set up a command center concept very, very early to respond to measles, a quarantine system, and I believe that although it was difficult to go through, it prepared us for what's coming up. Communication. I, I can't specify how important communication is. People are scared. People need to know that the leadership is behind them. We need centralized decision making. We have seven hospitals. Could you imagine seven hospitals doing their own thing? We have a command center in each hospital that talks to the central command center. We have daily huddles. Uh, I attend four huddles a day. We need to respond rapidly. York Hospital, being the largest and having the most uh, ventilators and most supplies and the highest level of care, was designated a COVID-19 center. Well, what does that mean? That means you don't necessarily want to bring patients uh, that have non-infected problems, non-infected diseases, routine uh, ED visits. You don't want them to come into your COVID center. We have a secondary hospital of surgery and rehabilitation. It's not secondary, it's a wonderful hospital, but we designated that as a non-COVID center should we need it. Luckily, two days ago, we decided that we're not going to go through that path because we still have bed capacity, but that's there for us. We can activate it in two days. ED tent testing. Every, everybody's doing this if you look in the news. Uh, we, we did it as early as we could. There were a lot of logistics to get through for that. Strict entry screening. Everybody gets screened. Everybody gets a temperature now, but before the thermometers were available, uh, everybody was screened, three screening questions, cough, fever, um, you know, uh, any, any changes. We now wear all masks all the time, and we did this about a week and a half ago. So again, being ahead of the curve. N95 respirators are limited, so we limited those respirators only for procedures that are aerosolizing in, in interventional radiology, basically and in some ultrasound depart, uh, with some ultrasound procedures. We have strict criteria for the distribution of all of these uh, personal protective uh, uh, items and are now converting to cloth masks for non-patient caring people. Everybody wears a mask, but we know we're going to run out. So uh, we, have, we have little old ladies that are retired making masks, and we have anybody with a sewing machine is now contributing, which is wonderful to see. Imaging rescheduled all screening and elective procedures approximately three weeks ago. 
we are rescheduling for April 23rd. I'm not sure that date is realistic. I have a feeling that we're going to push this further. What are we doing currently? Well, we're doing oncologic imaging because that shouldn't wait. Obviously, urgent emergent studies are still being performed because that shouldn't wait. But all elective oper uh, operative procedures are, 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 have ceased. So we're not imaging because nobody's going to do anything about that herniated disc unless it's critical. We closed our offices. We're limiting hours. I would say about 70% of our offices were closed. And those entrances are strictly monitored. We converted one of our inpatient towers to an ICU, which we're ramping up as necessary. Again, segmenting, utilizing what you have in a different way. The operating room is now segmented with negative pressure rooms. We're considering use, using uh, the OR ventilators for patients, we're considering using CPAP machine conversion for patients that, that have COVID. Everything is on the table. We have three CTs in my hospital. One of them is a COVID CT. Uh, we, we're trying not to cross-contaminate. Our IT department is, is very, very good at, at getting web pages together, getting our resources together, and this is what our dashboards look like. This is the entry to the dashboard. We have a fully integrated system, planning, clinical resource utilization on the right, uh, information. People are scared. Our president is wonderful at giving information to the staff, to the community. Everybody's scared. Our CT room. Um, People are smiling, but, but in, inside, they need to be reassured that we're giving them what they need. And the picture to the right is only important because I passed this room three times that day, and the scanner was empty. This is our inpatient scanner, one of the three we have. I've never seen an empty scanner in my institution. Scanners empty because our volumes are down and we're only doing patients that need to be done. Dr. Punjabi is going to show you a lot of slides on, on, on the disease process, so I, I want to minimize that, but frankly, since I'm a radiologist, I can't give any talk without some x-rays or CTs. This was our first COVID patient. Why was that important? Because we didn't know the patient had COVID. As a matter of fact, this was a surprise. We were reading the early articles, and if you look at the CT, minimal, minimal ground glass opacities, minimal mixed in the and alveolar disease, the first patient. As the patients get more acute, the findings are obviously more generalized. This is a classic peripheral ground glass opacity, reverse back wing COVID picture. If, if, if we see this, we mention it, and there are criteria because we don't want to impart diagnoses on patients that, that may, not, may not have COVID. So we're careful, but certainly I pick up the phone and say, I think this patient's got COVID. About four days ago, the Fleischner criteria came out and was published, I think, in, in radiology, um, dealing with when to get CT for COVID, when to get radiologic testing. Now, why is this important? The early articles out of China, and you know these, these are substantiated articles, have described that the earliest findings on CT may actually be more precise and more specific than testing itself. So that was kind of an upstir in, in my department. You know, how are we going to do this? Are we going to just bring patients in and test everybody with CT? Uh, and, and the American College of Radiology, I think, appropriately said no. That's not appropriate. So they put forth three scenarios. Scenario one, and I'm not going to go through all the arrows because, because you could, I, I encourage everybody to look this up. Scenario one, mild features, no resource constraints, and any pretest probability. I mean, you know, this is a patient that shows up. Bottom line is if you look at the circles, if you look at that second row, imaging not indicated, imaging not indicated. We were trying to not image patients what is the most important thing? Testing. This algorithm changes with testing. 
Well, scenario two is now moderate to severe features consistent with COVID. Any pretest probability, whether they're positive or negative, but we have resources. So what do we do? All of a sudden, imaging is indicated. No matter what the algorithm is, you go to imaging, especially if the patient is, is doing worse. And scenario three, which is the most tragic of scenarios, which is we have constrained resources. We don't have enough CT scanners. We don't have the ability to image everybody. Well, do what you can. Chest radiographs, better than nothing. CT, obviously the way to go. Uh, but again, rapid COVID-19 testing. To me, that is the key to this disease process. It's the way we triage patients. It's the way I know, with some probability, because you could certainly have a ne negative test, I know that, that this patient needs to be decontaminated, the room needs to be decontaminated, uh, gowns need to be changed. This is out of Bloomberg Magazine, their internet version. Well, physicians do what makes sense to them. If there's no testing, and I'm gonna read this, costly CT scans fill, uh, filling virus testing void for US physicians, people will go to what gives them the answer. Physicians will go to what gives them the answer. And, and you really, it, it's hard to stop somebody, you know, who wants to do the appropriate thing. I wanted to show this slide because uh, I actually just presented this. Uh, this is not my case, but I, I presented the slide at our all staff, all provider meeting. Um, because this is an interesting phenomenon that tells us what is going on and why are these patients, some of these patients dying so rapidly. It's called cytokine storm. In the brain, it's necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy. These patients end up building a tremendous rapid immune response that actually causes a hemorrhagic process in the brain and the lungs. They're not necessarily dying of COVID. They're dying of the immune response that, that their body is mounting. Rapid deaths, rapid you know, decompensation of patients Cytokine storm is often the reason, and it's treated somewhat differently. It's treated by anti-immune drugs. So what was our staffing preparation? Uh, well, we all have home workstations. I've got uh, 30 radiologists. 60 to 70% of them are now working from home. Uh, obviously, the interventionalists can't, but 70% but work from home. There isn't that much work, to tell you the truth. No radiologists have been furloughed so far, and, and that's critical. I mean, these are, this is our livelihood. There are three critical radiology roles that have been identified, okay? IR, we have four full-time IR docs that do what we call IR1, or significant, you know, angio, significant interventions. If one of them goes, we're in trouble. We have four mammographers that do interventional mammography. Same thing. We have to protect them. Nighthawks, one of my Nighthawks ended up being quarantined, okay? Critical, they cover every third two-week cycle. So if one of my Nighthawks leaves because of illness, we're in trouble. They're all working from home. Our ED is covering the CT injections. We used to work 24-7 in-house. We have several uh, docs that have uh, pre-existing conditions that put them at risk. We're protecting them, we're sending them home. They're not coming into the hospital at all. We have a couple of senior fellowship trained IR docs. I'm, I'm, I'm one. We're backing everybody up. Okay, if we lose an IR doc, I'm activated. I'm gonna come in in the middle of the night and do procedures, because that's what we do. Uh, I, have I done IR for, you know, I mean, I, I do biopsies, but I don't do heavy duty IR. I haven't done IR for 10 years, but, but it's critical. We have to back each other up. We have seven hospitals. Each has a, a medical executive committee. Each has its own bylaws. We emergency credentialed every radiologist across every one of our hospitals for this reason. Should we need to activate them? I can read cases for, for EFRTA, whereas before I couldn't. Look at your laboratory contracts. We now have Johns Hopkins helping us out with rapid testing. We have two, outpatient, uh, we have two uh, large labs helping us out. Uh, and we just developed an in-house test. Zoom meetings are the way to go. I mean, we're using Zoom for everything, and I think it'll change our culture significantly. 
so where are we now in York County? Uh, we are, I'm hoping, heading towards our plateau, but we're certainly on the upswing, and we are concerned about the next two weeks. How does this compare to New York? Well, New York may be at platform right now, but we are gearing up. When you look at this, New York, 8,600 deaths, New Jersey, 2,000, Michigan, 1,000. We are trying to keep York Hospital out of this demographic. We're trying to keep them out of that, out of any spike, and I'm hoping that, that we've accomplished this. I'm going to finish off um, my little segment with, with the things that are on all of our minds as imagers and as uh, administrators. 60 to 70 percent decrease in volume. What is going to happen to our salaries? Obviously, no volume, no salary. How is this going to affect our future? I just looked at my data, and your hospital imaging is down $12 million, $12 million just from this month. Significant. Many of the patients won't come back. We know this from snow days, for those of us that practice in, in, in any snow climate. Patients don't come back necessarily. You'll get most of them back, but now, at York, we have 30% unemployment. People can't feed their families. People can't pay the rent, okay? Their deductible is high. Are they gonna come in for imaging when they can't feed their families? The answer is no, and we're seeing a lot of patients come into the ED with hyperacute problems. The level, the volumes are down, but the level of acuity is very high. And, and you know, uh, Dr. Punjabi and I spoke about this. I mean, I'm seeing more perforated appendiceal abscesses, uh, Necrotizing uh, cholecystitis, patients are coming in sick. What if COVID returns? What, what if we start up too early? I'm very concerned about that. Practices that own equipment. Uh, I am, I'm no longer in a private practice. I'm, I'm a hospital employee. But when I owned equipment, that equipment had leases. You know, we rented the equipment or purchased them and amortized them over five years. That needs to be paid. That's not going away right now, even though volumes are down to zero for outpatient centers. Is the future that of mandatory layoffs? Are more people going to go from private practice into salaried environments, more radiologists? I've been getting quite a few calls about that. And I anticipate the need for low interest loans, perhaps even forgivable loans from the government, to kickstart this medical economy. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the future. So um, that is the end of my segment. I, uh, I wish everybody well and uh, stay safe and wash your hands. That, that's my only advice. Thank you, uh, Dr. Steiner, uh, for taking the time to put that together, sharing your insights there from, uh, from York. Um, uh, really interesting data that you shared. and. Um, We'll pause here for just a moment and take a few questions from the audience uh, that have come in before we turn it over to Dr. Punjabi. And, you know, <clears throat> one thing that you mentioned and uh, I think is important and on the minds of everybody is, you know, what is the long-term effect uh, of all of this on, I mean, not only radiology employees, and I recognize that's who we're really speaking to today uh, and those in related imaging uh, fields, but what is the long-term effect, in your opinion, on these folks, the morale? You know, you just talked about job security and really overall wellness. I think, you know, there's a great concern, you know, for those that are in the, in the hospital or in the imaging centers where they are actually uh, working. Um, you know, how do I stay safe? How do I make sure I don't bring this home as well? Any, any thoughts on that? And I'll ask Dr. Punjabi to chime in, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to him. There is certainly concern, and... Um... What we saw about 15 years ago is that radiologists were not retiring. Part of this had to do with the, with the stock market crash. I'm wondering whether this is going to flip in the other direction, whether radiologists that, that have a nest egg and, and are, are close to retiring or maybe should have retired five years ago in the old days, I'm wondering if it won't tip them over because I, I think that the demand, will, the demand will come back. Imaging will come back, no question. Um, we don't have enough radiologists. Recruiting is difficult. I'm wondering if this won't push more radiologists to retire, you know, when they're of the retirement age, and if it won't put even greater pressure 
on recruiting. I've got three positions that I've been recruiting for for you know for six months, and uh, in the old days they would fill immediately. And now, uh, especially for interventional radiologists, for uh, interventional mammographers, uh, I think it'll affect recruiting. I think that it's sobering, but I definitely think that you know when we get out of this, and it is when um, six months from now, a year from now. I think that we're going to, it's going to be back with a fury and it's going to be business as usual. Dr. Punjabi, would you uh, care to comment on that? Sure. Um, I, I think the one thing that's really important to recognize is the anxiety is real. And the anxiety throughout the hospital among the employees, that is the most natural response to this crisis. And the wrong approach would be to minimize that. I think what we've done is just constant communication, constant reassurance. Um, obviously, we can't tell anyone that they're going to be safe because we don't know that. But what we're telling everyone is that as long as we follow the policies that we have in place, we should be able to make it out of this. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll take one more question here before we turn it over to you. And uh, I mean, there, there are so many coming in right now, it's hard to even determine which ones to take. Uh, here's one with non-emergent imaging exams being canceled or delayed. Do you anticipate a backlog of exams following the reopening of ambulatory clinics? If so, any plans for an approach to servicing the backlog? I know we spoke a little bit about this. Uh, maybe I'll take that one to you first, Dr. Punjabi. That is a great question, and I anticipate um, that yeah, a lot of people think that this is going to be a V-shaped recovery. I anticipate this is going to be more like a U-shaped recovery with little hills and, and valleys in it. This is not going away anytime soon, but we have to have a plan. We have to have a plan to keep track of these cases, and we have, we have canceled. We have not rescheduled anything because we simply don't know when exactly we're going to reopen, but we have, we have kept close track of these cases, and we are going to start rescheduling at some point in the near future. Uh, we, uh, yeah, uh, Gopal, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, our approach was to reschedule um, for mammography, and I'm going to bring mammography up because we, we do about 48,000 mammograms a year, and uh, we picked a date that seemed reasonable. It may not be, actually, but we rescheduled all the patients because we didn't want to use the word cancel when we call patients up. And I think it's reasonable that, you know, we're giving them an opportunity and we're trying to get that business and keep it here. Um, my feeling is that this is not going to be a flip of the switch. We have seven hospitals, and if I look at the demographics, I'll tell you that York Hospital is somewhere in the middle in terms of infection. Gettysburg has little to no infection right now, whereas Ephrata. Uh, because it has a vector to New York, because the, the, the folks living in Ephrata have a lot of family in New York, Ephrata has spiked to a point where it's significantly greater in terms of infection, in terms of patients on, 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 on ventilators than, than New York is. So I think that we will open gradually. I think we'll open regionally. And today I, I had a meeting with uh, my chief uh, CT tech and, and my chief MRI tech, and we're thinking that once things lighten up a little, the subacute conditions that are backlogged, the bad back pain, the follow-up multiple sclerosis, um, you know, there, there are probably about 10 conditions uh, which we should start imaging slowly because they're subacute. These patients could be in trouble. And, and, you know, headaches, I mean, we all know that headaches almost never have any significant lesions that we can identify on an MRI, except for the patients that have tumors, and except for the patients that have, you know, hydrocephalus for a, for a secondary lesion, uh, you know, except for the patients that have pituitary adenomas that that are now hemorrhagic. So we're gonna we're gonna not flip a switch. We're gonna slowly introduce imaging back, and we're gonna do so. I don't think as a system. I I, I mean, we haven't decided yet. So I'm I'm speaking out of turn. I think, uh, but we're probably gonna open up. Uh, the lesser pandemic regions before we open up the large metropolitan area. Well, thank you for your insight there, uh, gentlemen. We're going to turn it over to Dr. Punjabi in the interest of time. We'll get back to um, some more Q&A following his talk. So with that, uh, Dr. Punjabi, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you so much. 
Um, I work at Hennepin County Medical Center, or Hennepin Healthcare is the name of the organization. We are one hospital and several clinics. Uh, we have been fortunate in having a significant disaster planning uh, set up for many, many years, including John Hick, who's one of the premier disaster planning people in the country. Um, so we've planned for all kinds of scenarios, but as a wise man once said, um, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So this thing has been a little bit of a punch in the mouth. Before I start my slides, I just want for one minute to remember Li Wen Liang, the whistleblower of Wuhan, um, who passed away on February 7th from coronavirus. Um, that was, I, I remember reading about that, and that was the day when it, when it seemed real to me. And ever since that, like most of you guys, I've been following exponential graphs um, and making plans to flatten the curve and so on. One of the most important things as we talk about flattening the curve is case deferral, which uh, Dr. Steiner touched about on a little bit. I think when we're doing case deferral, it's really important to set goals for the organization to understand what exactly we're trying to do. There is a social distancing aspect to it to minimize interactions between patients and healthcare, uh, intention to preserve uh, inpatient resources for when they are truly needed, when the surge arrives, and also a thought about redeployment. For example, you might need the uh, X-ray techs uh, in the ICU rather than in the outpatient clinical center. Now, we have to balance that with a real need of patients for ongoing wellness and care of chronic conditions. So it's, it, it, it is not really an all or nothing phenomenon here. Um, with that in mind, we started our case deferral process on March 16th. So we, were one of, we were one of the early people on this. Um, and we we canceled, like I said, all, all non-essential imaging exams, which included training exams. A lot of our exams were canceled in coordination with the clinics. And they did, actually, they called the patient canceling most of the exams. Um, now, like I said, we haven't rescheduled them, but we have them on a list, and we can call them when we decide to do them. Uh, we have retained most oncology exams, um, most PET scans and, and, um, and uh, CT scan follow-ups and MRIs and biopsies for oncology patients are happening as, as normal. Because we suddenly had a whole bunch of radiologists who didn't have that much to do, we've had a very low threshold for radiologist review. We've been calling ordering docs, asking them if they want the exam or do not want the exam. We even, even called patients. I've, I called a patient who was set up for a hip injection and asked her how bad her pain was, and her pain was really bad, so I had her come in. One interesting thing that's happened is because there's some clinics still functioning at kind of essential levels, we have walk-in CT, MRI, and ultrasound, which is really nice because our patients don't have to wait. The patient comes in, gets a CT scan for their cancer follow-up. We find a lymph node. The lymph node gets biopsied. All that happens in the same visit. Um, social distancing, obviously, is really important. Early on, we got all our non-essential staff to work from home, our IT people, um, some of our office staff and administrators have been working from home. Um, we've all had home workstations as radiologists for uh, 14 years now, um, so we can work from home, but I think it's really important as radiologists not to just abandon the department because that sends a really bad signal to um, the technologists that are working in the hospital. So we have retained uh, all our staff rotations. Um, we what we've done is we've done a, some form of social distancing in the workstation and in the reading room where each radiologist tends to stay at the one workstation. We have a ton of cleaning supplies. I see all of my radiologists walking around with wipes all day. Um, in some other places, there has been a redeployment of radiologists. At Hennepin, we haven't had one yet. We have a plan for a surge of up to 150 ICU patients without uh, re redeployment of radiologists. So, so far, they haven't asked me to intubate anyone, um, and I hope to God they don't ask me. Um, we do have our interventional radiologists uh, volunteering to do uh, bedside procedures in the ICU, um, lines and tubes, and, and uh, they actually have a procedural team along with the surgeons that covers uh, the ICUs so we can decompress the uh, uh, ICU docs a little bit. Um, early in March, we did a lot of planning around procedures. We did a lot of dry runs in CT and IR and other areas. We also um, worked with the ED to have a policy that all x-rays on, on our 
people under investigation were to be done portable. We also spent a lot of time and effort into our PPE policies, um, which, by the way, I think is going to be one of the two scandals that comes out of this whole thing. It's, one is going to be PPE, another is going to be um, testing. But um, the, the, the the interesting thing with the PPE is that the policies keep changing. And as you can see, the CDC, and it comes from the CDC uh, all the way down. And uh, at some point, they were telling us to use bandanas. So it's it's been very, very uh, frustrating um, for the frontline staff. Uh, to the Around about the end of March, we got to finally got universal masking and eye protection for all patient-facing staff, and I think that was really, really an important step. We have a residency program where we have residents from the university rotating um, at Hennepin Healthcare, uh, radiology residents. Uh, we early on coordinated with the program director. The one really important uh, thing that happened was because of markedly low and vo low volumes of uh, procedures, uh, we ended up having uh, needing less residents at work. So uh, we um, started having some of our junior residents actually show up on the evening shift where there uh, there is still some uh, work uh, regarding the ED. We have moved all our conference to, to Zoom, and I actually really like uh, Zoom um, because I can multitask while I'm doing conferences. Communication is really important. As we talked about, there's tremendous anxiety, and the anxiety is real. I think uh, timely communication can help a lot. We have a really nice, just like Dr. Steiner showed, we have a really nice dedicated uh, home on our internal homepage site just for COVID where they put up all the updates. We have daily department meetings of the department leadership. Every evening, we have all the department chiefs meeting with uh, the hospital leadership, and that has been uh, very, very, very nice. Uh, the frequency of emails, I think, is, is a little bit problematic, as I've noticed. Um, this is just from personal data, so um, and it's unpublished yet. But my COVID email volume, as you can see, looks very much like the volume of uh, the graph of um, COVID cases. And I am not such a big fan of email in general. But the one thing that I've done along with uh, radiology leadership is we send kind of like a weekly summary letter. And I've really enjoyed uh, doing that because it lets me give kind of like a big picture view to what is going on. There is going to be a significant revenue um, hit. Uh, we're already seeing our volumes are down 50 to 75%. Um, in radiology, it's going to lead to um, reviewing contracts, it's going to re review of uh, part-time radiology uh, radiologist situation, and I believe that there is going to be a hiring freeze, um, or it's going to be uh, some element of hiring freeze is going to happen, and that that's organization-wide. It's not necessarily um, uh, limited to radiology. Um, we are hospital. Uh, we are organization employed. We are all fully employed, so we are not dealing quite with all the concerns about equipment and, and which practices uh, own, but the revenue concerns are going to be real. I'm not entirely convinced that the post-COVID surge will occur in one surge. I think we will see multiple hills and valleys, and this short of getting a virus or a really effective therapeutic, this is going to be with us for a while. And as it's with us for a while, it will need us to look at creative ways of um, a suppressed state imaging, as it were, uh, workflow of the future, whether it is evening hours, weekend hours, figuring out ways to increase um, social distancing among patients. Um, Any time a patient enters, there's so many contacts where they have to, you know, the, the, the front desk, they have to check in, they have to sit down, they have to check in again. How can we minimize all those steps? I think that'll be, uh, that'll be very important. We're already seeing some things that are going to change forever. Uh, telehealth. Um, we were struggling. We had very little telehealth in our organization. From that, within a period of about a week or 10 days, our, organize, our uh, IT people got telehealth going, and now it's in every clinic that we have. It's remarkable how that's exploded, and that is going to be with us to stay. As we look at all these um, concerns, the one thing that's really, really important to me and one thing that goes to the core of what I do is to be careful about the wellness of the people that I work for. And um, I think frequent checking in is really important. Um, I make it a point to walk down um, the ED, uh, talk to the technologists most days, um, make phone calls to all my colleagues. I think those things are really, really important. Um, I, In general, I dislike the term social distancing. I think this is the time when we need to be socially closer than anything else because we depend on each other. 
physical distancing is, I think, what's important. So um, we need to take care of each other's wellness. Um, with that, I want to move to the second part of my talk, which is about imaging of COVID. That's a 3D CT, and I like uh, making these pretty pictures, but I am not. This, this is just purely for uh, showing off purposes. Um, Early on in uh, in January, we started seeing case reports of how uh, the Chinese were using CT scans, and the uh, images all looked the same, this kind of peripheral ground glass opacities, which were similar to their previous SARS epidemic in 2002 and 2003. By the middle of February, we started seeing reports of comparing it to PCR, and the Chinese thought it was more accurate than PCR. And then towards the end of February, we saw this large series of 1,000 patients where Dr. Tao Ai um, um, thought that CT was more sensitive than uh, PCR. They actually had a whole bunch of these examples where the PCR was negative, but the CT was positive, and the PCR eventually turned positive. So they concluded rather provocatively that CT could be a more reliable, practical, and rapid method to diagnose COVID. Now, I would be very, very cautious in interpreting this paper because there's all kinds of methodological problems in this paper. Um, but at the same time, towards early March, we saw articles in the lay press which talked about Chinese using CT scans basically on everyone. Uh, this article on March 4th um, talked in the New York Times talked about the, them doing up to 200 scans a day on a single machine. We didn't have a single case at that point, but we anticipated some sort of a demand for CT. So we started working on all our CT policies. Um, we established a PPE policy for techs and a room uh, cleaning policy. Those are really important to work with your infection prevention people. So for our PPE for CT technologists and X-ray technologists, the same um, anywhere across radiology, is that they just use, they, they have mask, eye protection, gloves, and gown for everything, every patient. Doesn't matter if the COVID suspect or not. And they use N95 masks and uh, pappers only if the patient uh, is intubated or there's aerosol generating procedure going on in the room. And as far as room closure and cleaning goes, we, um, with infection prevention, we got a policy. So long as the patient is masked and there is no aerosol generating procedure going on in the room, i.e. nobody suctioning or, or uh, on BiPAP or something like that, we just clean the room with Oxivir wipes, just basic clean, and we go on to the next patient. Um, and, and this has been our policy for, for more, than, more than a month now, for a month and a half. Um, we also put in a specific CT COVID uh, chest order on uh, EPIC. We did that to track patients and also because back then we did not know about the PE situation, but I did not want them to start doing a whole bunch of PEs on, on these patients. Um, a non-contrast CT is good enough to look for ground glass opacities. Um, we also developed our own um, in-house algorithm for inter to interpret these uh, CT scans. We have since, of course, abandoned that, and I'll talk about that. But on March 11th, all these organizations came out in a coordinated way and said CT had no role uh, in, in COVID at all. And uh, um, the Society of Thoracic Radiology actually went on to say that the only role for CT is in patients who have complications such as abscess or empyema which was kind of interesting. Since then, by the end of March, I think RSNA realized that the number of CT scans are going to increase no matter what. So they came up with this interpretation algorithm. So for those of you who are not using this, I would, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at this. This is really nice. All my clinicians love it and makes uh, things a lot easier for us. Um, by no means am I advocating that we need to do CT scans on everyone. But I do think there is a role for CT. Uh, there is certainly a definite role for X-ray. And uh, the Fleischner Society recommendations that Dr. Steiner went over, I think those are very appropriate. And I have to show some cases. So there we, here, so here we go. This is a 49-year-old female, um, completely normal chest X-ray. She had been symptomatic for several days at this point and positive for several days. So no imaging is going to be 100% sensitive. Um, but a lot of imaging shows these, a lot of x-rays show these classic findings. In At Hennepin, um, I think x-rays work fine. Maybe 80, 90% of the time are, are fairly diagnostic. Like this case, you see the peripheral ground glass opacities. A couple of days later, they look, you know, you can see them nicer. And just to mag up, you can see that these on both sides, these are very hazy opacities. For those of you um, 
you know, who, who talk about ground glass opacity being an ex, being a CT descriptor, just point out the first description of ground glass opacity was by Dr. Lebo in his paper on uh, dif discriminative interstitial pneumonitis published in 1965. So you certainly can use the word ground glass for x-rays. Um, the one thing that old timers like me will know is the photographic negative of pulmonary edema. It's really, I've seen several of these where the perihilar regions look completely spared and it's an entirely looks like an entirely peripheral process, like in this case, uh, and that's pretty classic. Um, sometimes the clinical history and the x-ray both can be difficult to interpret. This patient had just a little bit of cough on direct questioning. She did not complain of cough at all. She just wasn't feeling well. You look at the x-ray, maybe you can call something at the basis. Uh, maybe you can't. Maybe it's a little bit of atelectasis, but you do the C look at the CT, and it's absolutely classic. Um, the peripheral ground glass opacities, this patient ended up being positive. Um, another example, again, looks just like all the examples out of China. You have the peripheral ground glass opacities with the intralobular septal thickening, the classic crazy paving appearance. When I see this, I call the ER and I tell them this is as COVID -E as, the, as COVID gets. So in, in pandemic, there is no differential diagnosis. The one thing to be aware of is that um, there is a high incidence of PE in these patients. So you will see, um, like in this case, uh, this patient's D-dimer was through the roof. There are some ground glass opacities, but large pulmonary emboli centrally. Um, the CT appearance is by no means specific, though, so you want to be a little bit careful. Um, like in this case, um, peripheral ground glass opacities ended up being eosinophilic pneumonia. This was towards the early stage uh, of our pandemic. Um, this patient ended up, this is a very nodular appearance, so um, this would be atypical for COVID per the RSNA consensus statement. This patient ended up um, having um, histoplasmosis. And sometimes you can have superimposed uh, phenomena too. So in this case, there's extensive infiltrates in the left lung. This patient was COVID positive, but if you look at the CT, the infiltrates don't look like COVID. In fact, you have some tree and bud opacities, and this ended up being MRSA. So in conclusion, we are living in really interesting times. This is a once in a century event, which is what I tell my residents. The future is very uncertain. There's gonna be a lot of volatility and a definite huge financial hit, uh, no matter how you look at this, um, in spite of whatever government support that you might get. There will be long, last change, long lasting changes to all the things we do. Um, we want to plan for recurrent surges and for an eventual post-COVID state because we will make it out of this. That is absolutely certain. We will at some point. And currently, I think even though the role of imaging is evolving, CT use will probably remain marginal, at least in the United States. Thank you. Dr. Punjabi, thank you very much for sharing uh, both your experiences there uh, and how you uh, prepared for this. and. Uh, also, sharing some of those really great clinical images of what you're seeing with, uh, with uh, COVID-positive uh, patients uh, at your institution. Um, thankfully, uh, Dr. Steiner has been helpful in answering some of the questions that have been coming in uh, along the way because we would have never have gotten to them all. So hopefully some of you have had some of your questions answered uh, directly, uh, although a few of them I think I'd like to escalate up again for everybody to hear. Um, let me start with this one, though, because quite a few of the questions, you know, and Dr. Steiner, I think, uh, uh, mentioned this in his talk about, you know, how important the testing will be, and I understand there's a paper coming out of Mayo Clinic, um, and, uh, you know, from you know, what I briefly saw there, you know, they believe there could be a second wave of infected patients, um, you know, coming due to the inaccuracies, inaccuracies in the current testing. And, you know, certainly a number of you have said, you know, should we be doing more testing? I think the answer is clearly yes, but let's, uh, let's hear from Dr. Uh, Punjabi first, and then I'll ask Dr. Steiner to chime in on the importance of testing where we are, both in your own institutions and uh, what you think, you know, certainly nationwide. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have an in-house test, and we've had it for uh, about two weeks now. The turnaround time is a few hours. Now, a few hours is a lifetime. Um, but the, other, the really important thing is to understand the differences between analytical sensitivity and clinical sensitivity. The analytical sensitivity of these PCR assays that our labs use 
is, is exquisite. They can detect 250 copies of the virus on a swab. That is extraordinary if you think about it. Uh, it's a lot better than China where they, had, they were able to detect maybe 1,000 copies of the virus. But quantitatively, it really doesn't matter because most positive patients have a million copies in their, in their swab. So the, the, the issue is not the analytical sensitivity. The issue is the clinical sensitivity. And that depends a lot on how the swab is obtained what technique is used, whether it's nasopharyngeal, oral, how much, how deep was it, how long it was it, and and uh, and factors like that. But also when virus shedding occurs, so to which which is uh, which we don't know fully yet. So to assume that PCR was this exquisitely perfect test is, I think, deeply flawed. Dr. Steiner, um, as I said before. I believe testing is critical. Um, I mean, we're, we're driving a car blindfolded with a white stick pointing out the window trying to figure out where to go without testing. What we need to do is understand, isolate, uh, and eventually if we do uh, find an antibody standard that, that, that is usable, and perhaps we're very close, um, Mitigating this disease is, is the only way to go right now, and, and you can't do it if you don't know who has it, and you can't do it when there's a 7 to 14 day lag before the onset of symptoms where patients uh, can potentially shed significant virus. I, I agree with you. The, the testing, I, I did not mean to say um, minimize the importance of testing, uh, but um, what I would like us to see is to develop algorithms of combinations of tests, sensitive and specific, so that we catch the most number of patients that we can catch. A single patient that is told that their test is negative is will then go out or can then go out, and two weeks later, three weeks later, you're dealing with a cluster of cases that could be a, a dozen or more. So we sure. want to catch as many patients as possible and hopefully use a combination of tests and not just blindly um, believe in the PCR. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. All right. Switching um, slightly topics here. Uh, here's a question that asks that mentions there are some reports of pulmonary emboli in patients with COVID-19. Do you have any suggestions on minimizing the number of patients to undergo CTA PE studies of the chest to rule out the PE? Um, obviously, we're concerned about exposing our CT techs and others. Um, maybe you'll take that one first, Dr. Steiner. We, we are not great gatekeepers in, in imaging. I mean, we're a service organization in essence. So although we could advise, the bottom line is, is if the ED orders a contrast-enhanced CT for COVID with possible underlying PE, that's what we're going to do. And interestingly enough, that is certainly the pattern that I'm seeing in York Hospital. We, and we're finding more PEs than ever, and, and, uh, but, but the, the orders are coming through. It's, it's you know, I, I'm sure Dr. Punjabi uh, will agree with me that you, you know what's happening in your department when all of a sudden a, an unusual test gets ordered continuously, and you know that that means either an article came out or or you know something in in uh, emergency medicine came out that recommends it, and all of a sudden everybody on earth has a dissection, and everybody gets a uh, brain, neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT because there's an article that's out there. So I, I guess I uh, I really don't have an answer. My answer is uh, I do the study um, whenever I ask. Well, do you really need this? Uh, lo and behold, that's the patient that has a PE. So I've had mud slung <laughs> in my face so many times that, that the answer is we'll do it. We'll do it because there's an in increased incidence. And uh, it's, uh, it's a quick study. Uh, nephrotoxicity is minimal. Um, you know, with our new scanners, uh, I mean, you know, you could, you could do an entire PE study in, what, six seconds. 
you know, Dr. Steiner, you you have the humility that comes with experience. I think as radiologists, it's very very easy to be humble. The couple of things that I you know about about what what about the question. One is there are people developing uh, D-dimer um, thresholds because clearly the the usual D-dimer thresholds are not going to work for um, in in the setting of COVID because they all have increased D-dimer. But if you could perhaps have a threshold that's higher. I don't. I have not seen anything convincing about that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as far as put, protecting CT techs, um, I make it a point to talk to them frequently and, and um, down in the ED. And what I tell them is that we, so long as we follow our policies in terms of protection and PPE, we should be okay. And um, that's that's really important to keep stressing. Uh, they are universal masking. They are universal. They are wearing eye protection all the time. And I think at that point, uh, the risk is probably not that high. Although, of course, just like you, I see all these things and on on the news and and social media where people get um, get it from like 30 feet away or whatever. So, you know, um, this, the risk is not zero, but it's not not uh, not that high. What about the role of other modalities, um, MR, um, ultrasound? I mean, we're hearing talk about point-of-care ultrasound. Um, not sure if, if MR or others play a role um, or can play a role uh, in your – what are your thoughts there? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Punjabi. You know, point of care ultrasound is there's a lot of excitement and a lot of interest in it. And interestingly, some of them quote uh, the American College of Radiology saying that CT has no role. So they say, well, now ultrasound has a role. So it's kind of interesting how that's that's being spun. But um, it, it has the advantage, of course, of, of a patient not having to leave their room. Uh, I have no experience with it, so I have no authority to talk about it. MRI is a, is a great question because many of these patients will end up needing MRI. And... Um, Every everything in MRI is unique because of the magnet. So in terms of if you're talking about face masks or N95s, you know, with them they can't have the metal piece, uh, you know, for the patient, and and there's all these little quirks in MRI, and we honestly don't have answers for all the all the questions about MRI and and COVID positive patients. But I think that that actually might be worth a, a session in of itself. Dr. Steiner. Uh uh, again, these, these questions are great because uh, almost all of them uh, are examples of uh, what I've had uh, in the last week in meetings and point of uh, service ultrasound, ultrasound for COVID um, is brought up, and I'm very, very concerned about utilizing ultrasound in this manner, uh, not because you can't have cases that where you could clearly see, but as imagers, we understand CT. We understand radiographs. Um, we have the ability to, to, to see the mediastinum. We have the ability to, to interrogate the entire chest cavity without experience. And we don't have, I don't have any experience in ultrasound, but I'm very concerned. A, a chest radiograph, uh, as Dr. Punjabi said, a chest radiograph is so easy to obtain. The radiation dose is exceedingly low. It gives us so much information. Um, you know, the question is, is does chest ultrasound, uh, is it going to give us earlier information? Uh, because I'm uncomfortable with the interpretation and with the information I'm getting, it is difficult for me to, to tell 30 radiologists that now they're interpreting, uh, you know, point-of-care chest ultrasounds for COVID. So uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about using it. Okay, thank you for your insight there and your opinion. Uh, here's another one. Do you think that this pandemic will accelerate the development and usage of artificial intelligence applications uh, in the near future? Um, there was a few questions about AI in here, so we'll try to just wrap them all up in one. Uh, Dr. Punjabi, you want to take that one first? You know, it, it is. Um, I appreciate all the people trying to help with this. And I think, um, you know, you don't know what's going to help till you you have to have an open mind. And uh, if, if AI will help, whatever will help, I think we have to encourage uh, people to use their creative uh, 
genius in in figuring out solutions for us and so i i it may it may not currently i think um you know on x rays and uh, most in the us we're probably going to do very few cts uh we're, we're probably going to do not that many x rays even so i I don't know if the current scenario they're going to have much role, but the data from China is very promising in terms of AI, and I think it, it's yet to be determined uh, where this is going to go. Dr. Steiner, any comment? I happen to be a, a very excited and a true proponent uh, of, of AI uh, and the examples I've seen, and we're, we're going to implement AI in, in, in our large institution. We're currently uh, using rapid for stroke, uh, where my my push for AI is making life easier for imagers and pulmonary nodules. Uh, as we all know, are are monotonous. They're they don't take a high level of skill. They take a, 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 a lot of elbow grease to to go through a CT scan and identify every pulmonary nodule and find it. Uh, intracranial bleeds could be extremely subtle. I think AI has a tremendous role in that pneumothorax uh, and plain radiographs, um, mapping and, and defining tumor size and interval growth. Um, all of those processes allow us to get to a diagnosis quicker, PE, for instance, in an outpatient setting, uh, quicker, and deal with conspicuity of lesion. If I could find a lesion using AI, which I would overlook because I'm rushed, that's great. If, if I could define a pulmonary embolism in, in, in a patient in an office, and normally I'd re read that scan in 24 hours, but now AI is flagging it for me, that is terrific. I'm not sure that COVID is a great example of where AI can help, only because the lesions, especially on CT, tend to have really reasonable conspicuity. I mean, it's almost like you can't miss it. You can't miss ground glass opacity and infiltrates. So it's not gonna help me that way. All of these COVID patients uh, are, are, are gonna be either a level one or a level two interpretation for us. So we're gonna crank these out in usually in under 30 minutes and, and almost always in under an hour. So AI can't help me for that reason. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of AI. Don't get me wrong, I, I really believe that that is gonna be the future of imaging. I'm not sure COVID is the greatest example of where I need AI. Understood. Uh, we've certainly gone over time here. I wanna thank you both for staying on here a few extra minutes. Obviously there are more questions than we can get to. I'd like to try to get to just a few more. Um, and then we'll wrap things up if that's okay with you gentlemen. Certainly. Uh, there's a couple questions here about asymptomatic patients and whether or not would they be presenting with ground glass opacities as asymptomatic. And I know that we had talked earlier about, you know, the fact that patients are presenting late because they're just simply scared to go to the hospital. And I think we probably all know somebody who's got a cough or who has and they, they're calling it allergies right now. But, you know, what are your thoughts about that? You know, uh, those that are presenting late and, you know, and those that are asymptomatic, would they, if they were getting imaging, show the ground glass opacity? That is a great question. And there is a really nice paper that was published, I believe, about three or four weeks ago in radiology or looking at the cohort of patients on the cruise ship um, that was parked uh, off of Japan, and they found that 52% of asymptomatic people who um, had a swab positive had CT findings. So there is a certain percentage. The problem is, you know, again, I want to be very, very careful about this. Population screening, where you put up a CT scanner on a Walmart parking lot and screen patients that way, is almost not, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's not going to work, and no one can really advocate for that. But there, it's kind of interesting, like the case that Dr. Steiner showed as well was positive on CT before they got uh, uh, the labs. So there, and you know, we, we've seen asymptomatic patients in our hospital with CT findings too. Yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Punjabi 100%, and uh, it just gets me back to my, uh, my pulpit testing. Um, I don't think CT is, early detection by CT does occur. We've seen it. Asymptomatic patients, minimally symptomatic patients, but detection techniques 
I think is the way to go, rather than radiating an entire population and 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 cranking them through. I agree. I, I think that the 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 Chinese model, where they had these fever clinics, where they actively sought patients, and they would then uh, um, you know uh, put put them through a scanner two hundred a day, is not going to work in the United States. Dr. Punjabi, um, <clears throat> I know you have. Uh, and, and I'm sure Dr. Steiner does too, but I know that you and I have worked on a couple of talks where um, you're using some state-of-the-art CTs over there, the, the spectral CTs, and I know there's a feature on there that's probably not widely known, the electron density uh, component. Um, I've heard rumors that maybe that might help in picking this up. I mean, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I've been uh, seeing reports of that. It sounds super intriguing. Um but I'd, 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 I'd need to see more. Um, the, right. the issue, again, like I said, is, is eventually it's a philosophical question. It's a social question. It's actually a political question. How many cases do you want to detect? Do you want – how comfortable are you with false negatives as opposed to false positives? Because the whole role of imaging is going to be primarily in – depends on what how good PCR is. If PCR is missing some patients and you want to catch them, then you want to do imaging. That, I think, like I said, is probably a lot – far above my pay grade and involves a whole bunch of uh, um, bigger uh, social issues as to how we want to approach this. But it certainly seems very, very intriguing. Spe spectral CT or dual energy CT is my my area of uh, um, interest. So I, I certainly think it's very interesting. Doctor, uh, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll make this sort of the final question and kind of Take it, take it back to the financial side of things and the economic impact, and maybe I'll just have you both comment, um, you know, both not only to your departments, but outpatient imaging services as a whole, you know, what are your thoughts on the sort of overall economic impact? I know you alluded to this, Dr. Steiner, in your talk um, as we sort of close things up here, um, you know, just some final thoughts there on the economic side of the business. Um. Thank you. Uh, it, it will be significant. There's no question. Again, um, looking at our volumes, uh, down 70%. Um, are we going to catch up? Somewhat. Are we going to capture all that back? Probably not. Are we going to have capacity when we open the doors uh, to interpret all of these studies? Uh, how are we going to do it? Are we going to do it in shifts? Uh, but, if again, giving you that rough number of uh, $12 million drop in revenue uh, in imaging in one month, um, you know that as you extrapolate that over two to three months, uh, salaries are going to be impacted. They cannot not be impacted. If you're in a private practice, you get the hit directly and immediately. Uh, if you're an employed physician, I think there is a buffer built into the system. It's it just it, it, that, that's the model. Uh, you know, employed physicians may have a lower upside, but they're buffered somewhat more on the downside. Uh, but this will have a significant impact on salaries. Uh, it'll have an impact on hiring. It'll it'll really change the way we look at our own systems, uh, at how we're reimbursed, uh, and. Uh, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not sure how it'll play out, but impact absolutely. I'm 100% sure that this is going to have uh, a significant impact, uh, at least for uh, the you know the next fiscal year. You know, the the one thing I, I I absolutely agree with you, Dr. Steiner. The impact is going to be massive. Just today, the entire social uh, the small uh, business administration uh, amount has been exhausted. That's 350 billion dollars gone in in the blink of an eye. The one thing I want to bring up, though, is we serve un the underserved population here at, uh, at Hennepin Healthcare, and this thing is hitting our underserved people, our minorities, really, really hard. Social distancing really is a uh, is a thing for for people with means by and large if you don't have means um social distancing is really not that much of an option if you're living in a one bedroom apartment uh five people there is not going to be social distancing i'm fortunate i have a basement i can go there if i catch it but most of my patients can't so this the, the economic impact of this is just going to be just astounding and and the 
poor people are are the and and the you know a lot of the minorities that we serve are the ones that are getting hit on both sides they're getting hit by the disease and they're going they're getting hit by the economic impacts of the disease so this is this is really quite an extraordinary time and i you know i i just pray that we get through this um it's it's going to be hard there's just no no way to sugarcoat that one final question because it's actually i noticed it's it's, it's been asked a couple of times and i missed it and it, it has to do with uh a, i think a comment you made dr steiner about you know radiologists uh, working from home um and then being able to read from home home pack stations etc um and i think you might have said maybe even 60 to 70 percent of your radiologists are doing that now is that true even prior to uh the COVID environment and do you see that becoming more prevalent um, and if so, you know, what kind of a ho home setup system are people using for reading? Um, in in, in WellSpan, uh, we have a full diagnostic pack system that is identical to the system with which we read in the hospital. So, you know, it's a $30,000 system, uh, very high end. Um, we have uh, rapid connectivity uh, that is brought to our home. Uh, and, and that is paid for by WellSpan, and it allows us to function at home as if we were in the hospital environment. Um, that being said, I personally like being in the hospital a lot more than I like being at home, so, so I, I agree with Dr. Punjabi. Uh, I'm kind of a social creature, and, and uh, going in, to me, is fun. Um, the radiology department that we serve has a limited number of bays for reading. We have a kind of a bullpen kind of environment. Um, and we actually have more work than we can service with radiologists in the hospital, number one. Number two, I find that radiologists at home are far more productive. Again, maybe because I'm a social person and I walk around and I say hello to people and I talk to referring physicians. I like doing that. I think that that drives a good department. I, I tell people, look, you know, we're here to answer questions, and there's nothing better than having ED doc come around and say, could you can you show me this? Um, so in general, we try to have three radiologists working from home every day, and this is historical. You know, I, I mean, ever since I was chairman, uh, I've become chairman there, so I'm on. I've been there for three years now. Uh, we have three people working for home, from home whenever possible. So culturally, we were already halfway there. Um, will it change? I, I think this will change us culturally. I, I think that uh, departments that don't have home workstations and don't give their radiologists home workstations will have to. I think that's where we're evolving. Um, so uh, the cultural shift has occurred. We did it a little early because we had the need. Um, and um, and I think I think it'll progress. You know, just to add my my two cents on that, Kieran, um, we've had workstations home for forever, and we all read from home. But the interesting thing to look as we go forward is how many of our doctors are going to start working from home. Because I used to call my clinicians from home, and they would say, "Where are you?" You know, I was home, of course. Now they're home too because they're doing telehealth. So going forward. Maybe the patient's going to be at home, the doctor's going to be at home, and the radiologist is going to be at home. Certainly uh, an interesting paradigm shift. Um, well, gentlemen, uh, we have certainly exhausted our time here, and we didn't even you know, get to all of the questions, but um, I certainly want to uh, thank you both uh, for your time today, um, both in preparing your talks and taking as many questions as uh, we were able to uh, to take today. And and certainly on behalf of uh, you know, Phillips and the entire team here at Applied Radiology, we, we really can't thank you enough for the incredible job you did today. So thank you both. Thank, thank you, you for thank uh, you. inviting us. Thank you, Karen. Take care, everyone. So um, let me uh, thank again Phillips for making today's event possible through their continued commitment and support of these events. And with that said, I'd also like to point out that uh, we have another webinar coming up um, later in the, uh, I think it's May 5th, it's coming up uh, with Dr. Tannenbaum on the role of CT, 
chest x-rays and MRI productivity tools for a post-COVID surge. You've heard us talk about what will happen uh, post-COVID uh, and, and the resurgence of, um, of uh, imaging procedures. So um, keep an eye out for that. There's also a link in the uh, resource area if you'd like to, um, to register for that event. And finally, as always, we want to thank you, our uh, audience, for joining us today. Some of you are new to Applied Radiology. We're seeing you for the first time, and we really appreciate your support. Um, most of you and your colleagues from around the globe are fearless healthcare professionals, and we thank you for your resilience, dedication, and spirit as you care for your patients in this very uncertain time. So please know that we are thinking about you. Stay safe and stay healthy. And with that, our webcast has ended. Thank you for joining us.